You're voting for class president. There are three candidates. Alice. She wants longer lunch breaks and better cafeteria food. Bob. He wants more school funding for sports and clubs. Carol. She wants shorter school days and no homework. 100 students vote. Here are the results. Alice. 40 votes. Bob. 35 votes. Carol. 25 votes. Alice wins. She's your class president. But wait. 60 students, the majority, voted against Alice. They preferred Bob or Carol. So how is Alice the legitimate winner when most people didn't want her? Okay, fine. Let's try a different voting system. Let's do ranked choice voting. Everyone ranks all three candidates. After counting, Carol wins. Because when you look at who people ranked second, Carol was the compromise candidate most people could live with. But hold on. In the first system, Alice won. In the second system, Carol won. Same voters, same preferences, different winner. Which system is fair? Which one represents what people actually want? Let's try a third system, a runoff election. We eliminate the candidate with the fewest votes, Carol, and then people vote again between Alice and Bob. Bob wins the runoff. So now we have three different voting systems, three different winners. Alice wins plurality. Carol wins ranked choice. Bob wins the runoff. All three systems seem reasonable, but they give completely different results. This isn't a quirk. This isn't bad luck. This is a fundamental mathematical reality. In 1951, a young economist named Kenneth Arrow proved something that shattered the foundations of democratic theory. There is no voting system that is truly fair. Not, we haven't found one yet. Not, some systems are better than others. No voting system can satisfy basic fairness criteria that you'd think any reasonable system should meet. This is Arrow's impossibility theorem, and it proves that democracy, the way we think it works, the way we assume it should work, is mathematically impossible. Every election you've ever voted in, Every will of the people, every democratic decision, it's all built on a lie. A necessary lie, maybe, but a lie nonetheless. Let me show you the math that proves we've been pretending democracy works when the fundamental logic beneath it is broken. Before I show you Arrow's theorem, let me show you why this matters with a real example that happens constantly. 2000. U.S. presidential election. Three major candidates. George W. Bush, Al Gore, and Ralph Nader. Florida vote. Bush. 2,912,790 votes. Gore, 2,912,253 votes. Nader, 97,488 votes. Bush wins Florida by 537 votes. Florida's electoral votes give Bush the presidency. But here's the thing. Most Nader voters preferred Gore to Bush. If Nader hadn't run, Gore almost certainly wins Florida and becomes president. So Nader, who had no chance of winning, changed who won by splitting the vote. This is called the spoiler effect. Is this fair? Nader had every right to run. His voters had every right to vote for him. But their sincere votes for their preferred candidate resulted in electing the candidate they liked least. The voting system punished them for voting honestly. You see this in every election with more than two candidates. Third parties are called spoilers because they split votes and change outcomes without winning. 2016. Some Democrats blame Jill Stein for Trump's win in key states, 1992. Some Republicans blame Ross Perot for Clinton's win, 1912. Theodore Roosevelt's third-party run split the Republican vote and gave the election to Democrat Woodrow Wilson. Every time this happens, people say, we need a better voting system, ranked choice, approval voting, something that doesn't punish people for voting for who they actually want. And that's where Arrow's theorem comes in to deliver the bad news. There is no better system. Every system is broken in some way. Let me show you what Arrow proved. Arrow started with what he called fairness criteria, basic things you'd want any reasonable voting system to satisfy. Criterion 1. Unrestricted domain. Complete freedom. Voters can rank candidates in any order they want. No restrictions on preferences. This seems obvious. In a democracy, you should be able to prefer whoever you want in whatever order. Criterion 2. Unanimity. If everyone agrees, that wins. If every single voter prefers candidate A over candidate B, then the voting system must rank A above B. Again, obvious. If literally everyone prefers A to B, then A should beat B. Criterion 3. Independence of irrelevant alternatives. The relative ranking between A and B should only depend on how people compare A to B, not on what they think about some third candidate C. This is the key one. Let me explain with an example. Say there's an election, Alice versus Bob. Alice wins. 
Now Carol enters the race. People vote again. Nobody changed their minds about Alice versus Bob. Everyone who preferred Alice to Bob still does. But now Bob wins because Carol's entry changed the vote dynamics. This seems unfair. Carol is irrelevant to the Alice-Bob comparison. If everyone's relative preference between Alice and Bob stayed the same, shouldn't Alice still beat Bob? This criterion says, the ranking between any two candidates should depend only on voters' direct preferences between those two, not on the presence or absence of other candidates. Criterion 4. No dictator. There shouldn't be one person whose preference always determines the outcome regardless of what everyone else wants. Obviously necessary. One person dictating outcomes isn't democracy. These four criteria seem reasonable, right? They seem like the bare minimum for a fair voting system. Here's what Arrow proved. No voting system can satisfy all four criteria simultaneously. Not, we haven't designed one yet. It's mathematically impossible. If you have more than two candidates and more than two voters, you cannot create a system that meets all four fairness criteria. You have to violate at least one, always. This is a mathematical theorem proved rigorously. It's not opinion, it's not politics, it's logic. Let me show you why every system fails. Plurality voting, most votes wins. This is what we use in most elections. Whoever gets the most votes wins, even if it's not a majority. Which criterion does it violate? Independence of irrelevant alternatives. Remember the Bush-Gore-Nader example? Nader's presence changed the winner between Bush and Gore, even though people's relative preferences between Bush and Gore didn't change. Spoiler effect. Third parties ruin the contest between the frontrunners. Runoff elections. Eliminate the lowest candidate and revote. Keep going until someone has a majority. Which criterion does it violate? Also independence of irrelevant alternatives. Here's a paradox. Imagine Alice beats Bob in the first round. Then they face Carol in round two. But Carol beats Alice. So we have a cycle. Alice greater than Bob, Carol greater than Alice, but also Bob greater than Carol. The order you eliminate candidates matters. Change the order, change the winner. The irrelevant candidate being eliminated first versus second changes the outcome. Ranked choice voting, instant runoff. Everyone ranks all candidates. You eliminate the lowest ranked candidate and redistribute their votes based on second choices. Repeat until someone has a majority. This is supposed to fix the spoiler problem. Lots of voting reform advocates push for this. Which criterion does it violate? Still independence of irrelevant alternatives. Here's a real example. 2009, Burlington, Vermont mayoral election used ranked choice voting. Three candidates, Bob Kiss, progressive, Kurt Wright, Republican, Andy Montrell, Democrat. Wright got the most first place votes, but under ranked choice rules, after redistribution, Kiss won. But here's the weird part. If Wright hadn't run, Montrell would have won, beating Kiss head to head. But Wright's presence changed the winner from Montrell to Kiss. Wright was a spoiler in a system designed to eliminate spoilers. Board account. Everyone ranks all candidates. First place gets three points, second place gets two, third gets one. Highest total points wins. This seems fair. It considers everyone's full ranking. Which criterion does it violate? Independence of irrelevant alternatives, spectacularly. Say Alice is winning. Bob's campaign manager realizes, we can't beat Alice directly, but what if we recruit Carol to run? Carol will take points from Alice, and even though Carol won't win, she'll lower Alice's total enough that Bob wins. The presence of a candidate who has no chance of winning can completely change who wins among the real contenders. Strategic candidate entry can manipulate the outcome. Approval voting. Vote for as many candidates as you approve of. Most approvals wins. Which criterion does it violate? Technically, this one violates the unrestricted domain criterion in a subtle way. It doesn't let you express intensity of preferences or rankings. But more importantly, it creates strategic voting problems. If Alice and Bob are frontrunners and you prefer Alice, should you also approve Bob as a compromise? Or does that hurt Alice? The optimal strategy becomes a guessing game. Condorcet method. Find the candidate who would beat every other candidate in head-to-head -head matchups. Sounds perfect, right? If Alice beats Bob head-to-head -head and Alice beats Carol head-to-head, -head, then Alice is the Condorcet winner. Problem. Often, there's no Condorcet winner. You can get cycles. Alice beats Bob, Bob beats Carol, Carol beats Alice. Rock, paper, scissors. No clear winner. Which criterion does this violate? In cases with no Condorcet winner, you have to use a tiebreaker method. And every tiebreaker method violates independence of irrelevant alternatives. See the pattern? Every system breaks. 
every system violates at least one fairness criterion that seems obviously necessary. This isn't because voting system designers are stupid. It's because Arrow proved it's mathematically impossible to satisfy all the criteria. You can choose which criterion you're willing to violate, but you can't avoid violating at least one. This is like asking for a four-sided triangle. The concept itself is contradictory. Fair voting with more than two candidates is mathematically incoherent. Now you might be thinking, okay, but democracy still works, right? We make it work somehow. Sort of. Here's what we actually do. We pretend the problems don't exist, and we use systems that kind of sort of work most of the time. Most democracies use plurality voting for single winner elections because it's simple and fast, even though it creates spoiler effects and minority rule. We accept these flaws as the price of democracy without admitting that there's no alternative system without equivalent or worse flaws. And we use a trick. We mostly stick to two-party systems. Arrow's theorem requires three or more candidates to create impossibility. With only two candidates, most voting systems work fine. A beats B or B beats A. Simple majority rules. So political systems evolved, either naturally or through structural incentives, to consolidate around two major parties. In the U.S., Democrats and Republicans. Third parties exist but rarely win. In the U.K., historically labor versus conservative, though this is fracturing. Two-party systems aren't in the Constitution. They're not legally required. They emerged because they're the only way to make voting systems work without running into Arrow's paradoxes. But two-party systems create their own problems. Lack of real choice. You often vote against someone rather than for someone. Moderate candidates get pushed out. Primaries select for extremes. Issues get bundled. You can't vote for Party A's healthcare and Party B's education policy. We've traded Arrow's paradoxes for a different set of problems, but at least the math works. If this changed how you see elections, share it. If you've ever wondered why voting systems seem broken, hit that like button. Subscribe. Because now that you know about Arrow's impossibility theorem, you'll never look at an election result the same way again. Democracy isn't mathematically fair. It's just the best impossible system we've got.